Do you want you me to go? Her, I can introduce myself. Why are you I think it, no. That's fine. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Lindsay Myers. Um, I am a genetic counselor by training. Um, I have been a cardiac genetic counselor since I graduated school, so a little over 10 years. Um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about what a genetic counselor is and does in gen genetic testing. I recognize that a lot of you may have already met with a genetic counselor or had genetic testing. Um, so it would be interesting to me if you've met with a genetic counselor before. Could you raise your hand just so I kind of get a pulse? Awesome. Some of you have. So this may be a refresher or review for some of you, but also... I would challenge you to look at in light of how my, I talk to my family members or if you have children when they get older, they may see a genetic counselor when they're thinking about having kids or going through that transition to adulthood to, re, to rediscuss if they've had genetic testing or their diagnosis in general as far as family planning um, implications too. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to stop. Um, I've kept this very basic, so if you have any more questions you want me to dig into, I'm happy to go into further detail. So, first I'm going to start off by the basics. <laughs> what, who are genetic counselors and really what is genetic counseling? Um, our training is uh, in medical genetics and counseling. We have master's degrees, usually in genetic counseling or sometimes human genetics. Um, so we're not physicians, but we are a, a medical provider. And because we get training in both genetics and counseling, um, that equips us to not only talk to the genetics of particular conditions and how that could affect you and your family, but also recognize and give some guidance on the emotional impact of these. So a lot of feelings can go along with thinking about our family, grief, worry, all of that. So they can help talk through some of those as well. And we work as part of the healthcare team. So we usually will work with your physicians, um, cardiologists or other physicians that may be involved to help them say, what is this genetic testing or the family, t uh, the family history? How does that maybe impact your medical management or your child's medical management? Is there anything else we should be thinking of with this particular result? Um, and what does this result mean? So we work kind of all together with the healthcare team. And then I have the actual definition of what genetic counseling is up there, but I think the take home here is it's a process. Um, so we can talk about, as I mentioned, the medical implications, but also the psychological implications of a genetic diagnosis with or without genetic testing. I know a lot of people think genetic counseling equals genetic testing, but I want to erase that <laughs> conception because we... Um, we would rather just inform you and give you the details and it doesn't equal genetic testing always. Um, so I know that can sometimes get put with genetic counselor. So the genetic counseling model, just a little bit more about it, it really is an active process. So they had mentioned shared decision-making previous and that has always been our motto. Um, we really wanna have an active conversation with the families and answer your questions, get any concerns, um, your prior beliefs, your values, whatever that is for your family and take that in consideration in our conversations. So that kind of leans to the patient centeredness of it and that our, we are also non-directive. So we may make recommendations or give some screening guidelines, um, but we do this so that you have all the information um, and we're not meaning to say this is what you have to do. And then that is because we want to empower you to make the decisions that are best for you and your family. Um, and then I already spoke to this a little bit about the anticipatory guidance. So we can um, cover sometimes like how people may feel after they have a genetic test or how people may feel talking to their child about a diagnosis or their other family members and give you some tools to help with that as well. Um, so a little bit more about what we do and actually what's in a session. Um, so one of our main goals is to educate. We talk about what are genetics, what are the genetic implications of a particular condition, and we may even talk about non-genetic 
um, contributions to a particular condition. So if you take acquired long QT syndrome, we may ask, you know, are you on medications that could prolong the QT interval and try and take that into our risk assessment. Um, we'll educate on how this may impact the rest of the family, how a condition may be passed down in the family, and then also about genetic te testing options if those are available. And then on the back end of that, if somebody does have genetic testing, we really can help to interpret those results. If you get this report and you're like, I have no idea what this means, there's a C dot and a P dot, and this is really just foreign to me, we are the people that can also help break that down and explain, okay, this is exactly what this means, and here's how we may use that for your medical care or your family's medical care. And I think one of the biggest things is we really want to serve as a support to families as well. Um, I mentioned earlier, if you need support talking to your extended family, if you need some people don't know about SADS, so we would definitely hook people up with SADS and other support organizations. Um, sometimes we connect families together that are going through a similar, a family that's going through a particular situation that's looking to connect to another family that's been through that for support. So we can offer all of those resources as well. And then at the end, just, um, this probably should have been moved up, but um, assess. So if you've ever seen a genetic counselor and they're asking you all these very personal questions about your family history, it's really because that goes into our assessment for your genetic risk for a particular condition. And I have a little bit more on that later, um, but it can help us pinpoint who else should we be talking to? Who else may be at risk and have need genetic testing um, in your family? So, that's kind of the process of genetic counseling as well. Um, I like to put this slide up there, what we don't do, because there can also be some <laughs> misconceptions about that. We are a genetic counselor, but we are not a therapist. We're not psychologists. Um, we do not practice as a licensed therapist at all. It's really counseling about how a genetic condition may impact your family. And then we can also recognize, or we usually recommend, as um, they previously did, I think it's always helpful for families to go to a therapist to talk to other things for psychological impact of some disease. Diseases. We do not require genetic testing. If you're coming to a genetic counselor, we are not going to make you get genetic testing. We may talk about it with you and discuss that with you and what the pros and cons are, which I have some later, but we do not require that. So, um, and the lastly, we don't recommend, or we don't recommend that you don't have children. So a lot of people also think of genetic counselors as like, they're going to tell me I'm going to pass this down and I shouldn't have kids. Absolutely not. We want you to understand your risks. And if there are other options out there that are available, we want you to understand that. But it's your family and your values and every family has different experiences with things that uh, impact their decisions for family planning or whatever else it is. So really, our job is to make sure you have the information to make the best decision for yourself. So um, just a slide about if you are seeing a genetic counselor, what can you do beforehand? Um, it can be helpful to gather your family health history. I have some questions on the side that are specific to um, inherited arrhythmias that we may ask some details about. So you can read through those, but that is because most of those questions can help us with the risk assessment and is there something in the family that other people have that they didn't really know? Um, so like, sudden unexplained deaths. This would include people that had a single motor vehicle accident. So they were the only one in the car and they had an accident where they crashed into a tree or something or drownings as well. Um, so we may ask some of those questions. So sometimes it can be helpful to reach out to your family members because I know I wouldn't know that off the top of my head and I'm a genetic counselor. Um, so we don't always talk about those things at family gatherings. So collecting that information can be helpful. So during the session, we can can uh, take a full family history for that. And then bring any questions or concerns that you may have, whether it's about genetic testing, if you read something online about the condition um, or the genetic contribution or other risks, we can also help address those. Um, and sometimes it's helpful to consider bringing a support person, whether that's a friend, a family member, whoever, um, because it's a lot of information. Genetics sometimes isn't the most exciting. I'm biased. I might think it is. Um, so it can be helpful to have somebody to help you remember some of those, especially if you're just already getting a lot of information. If you're meeting with a cardiologist the same day and then a genetic counselor, it can be helpful just to have a support person in general. 
Um, so during the genetic counseling visit, what will happen, mainly you'll start off by contracting. And really what that is, is in genetic counselor terms, it's goal setting. So why are you here to see us? And what do you hope to get out of today's visit? So we really want to know what you would like to discuss, um, what you've been told prior. And we really will assess that because we want to make sure that we're on the same page and we can discuss in um, context of other information you may have been told. Um, we'll go through your medical history. So if we have access to your medical records, we ha will have assessed that and already taken it. A lot of times genetic counselors work within a cardiologist office, not always. Sometimes you go to them in another office. Um, so that can, if you're seeing a genetic counselor outside of your cardiologist, it can be helpful to bring your records or have those sent so that they know that ahead of time, especially if you've had genetic testing prior. Those are really important to send over. Um, as part of the medical history, that includes your family history. So that's where we'll ask you all those questions. We'll draw out a pedigree. Have you guys had a pedigree drawn out for you before? Most of you, yes. I have a picture on the next slide. Um, and the pedigree is basically our lingo for our family history. And that can really help us in that risk assessment and kind of help decide who should be tested, who might want to talk to a genetic counselor, who might you want to talk to um, within the family to discuss these risks and then provide guidance. So once we've given you all the information, we can really sit down and talk about how you would like to proceed. So this is an example of a pedigree or a family history and how we draw them out. If you've seen it before, you're probably familiar with this, but really um, squares are the boys and circles are girls. We have other um, symbols for um, non-binary people and other genders. Um, we also have symbols for if you're adopted or if somebody um, is adopted in or out. So there's this is just showing the basic ones. And really it's just constructed from generation to generation. Generation. So the bottom is one generation. So this would be somebody's, um, this person here would be our proband, which is just the first patient that comes in to see us, brings to attention. And this would be their children, their brothers and sisters, and their niece and nephew, and so on. So you can see that labeled out. So that when we're scribbling down all those squares and circles, that's what we're doing. And it's really to help us with the risk assessment. And your cardiologist can be helpful as well. So in, to wrap up the genetic counseling section, section, really our goal is to support you. So as a genetic counselor, what I want you to take home is that you feel like you got the information you needed, you feel like you got your questions answered, and you feel like you kind of understand what outcomes may be if you decide to go with testing or without testing, um, what the possible results are, what those implications could be for you and your family. And then I'll transition and talk a little bit more about genetic testing as well. Questions so far? No. Okay. <laughs> so moving on to genetic testing. I'm not going too depth into the, the different genetic tests for the inherited arrhythmias. I'm just giving kind of an overview. So one, genetic testing um, is pretty universally recommended for most inherited arrhythmias by all of the major medical societies. So you've probably heard of maybe the American Heart Association would be an example of that. They all come out with these guidelines on how we um, should take care of our patients. And for genetics, most of the t uh, most inherited arrhythmias have these recommendations that patients with a diagnosis should be tested. So anyone who has a clinical diagnosis of a particular inherited arrhythmia they recommend testing for. And then if somebody in the family has had testing and they were positive, they also recommend testing for at-risk family members. So what that means is it's typically covered by insurance because once something is a medical guideline, insurances then will start to cover it. So genetic testing is typically covered by health insurance. It is so much cheaper than it used to be when I first started. It was like five grand, I think, when I first started practicing. And now self-pay price is around 250. And not to mention a lot of um, labs have other financial assistant programs. So they will discount that based on your income. Um, um, some people that are uninsured or have Medicaid, also there will be no charge associated with some labs. And joint counselors, like, we can help find those things. We can help find the most affordable way to get that done because we really don't want cost to hinder your access to genetic testing. Um, and when we do genetic testing, I mean, there probably are a little more than three, but <laughs> universally we think there are three possible genetic testing results. And I only say that because we typically just think of positive and negative, right? Positive, great, we've confirmed the diagnosis, we can talk about it. Negative has its own implications, which I'll talk about. But there is this other 
option um, or other result that you may hear variant of uncertain significance or inconclusive. <laughs> they are the bane of all of our existence, but they are very common. I have a slide on that. So really um, that means we found something, but don't really know what it means. So it can add a level of uncertainty and I'll talk more about that as well. Um, so some benefits and limitations to direct testing. Benefits, it can help confirm a clinical diagnosis, especially if there's some question, we're unsure, we don't know if maybe this is acquired long QT or congenital, for example, um, or we think somebody's EKG pattern is consistent with CPVT, but this can really help confirm that diagnosis. Um, and sometimes it can help guide your medical management. So for long QT syndrome, sometimes the underlying gene that's identified, we can then say, okay, we know for sure you have long QT type two, um, and then we can know the triggers that go along with that a little bit better. So for type two, we know that postpartum women can be a little bit higher risk, so we'll counsel about that. And the cardiologist then can use that information to also help manage those patients. Um, and sometimes a genetic test may say, okay, your heart's affected, but maybe we need to worry about something else. This is rare in the inherited arrhythmias, but it can happen. There may be other heart rhythm issues that go along with that that we weren't thinking about. Um, sometimes heart muscle issues can go along with something that we weren't thinking about. So they can sometimes impact your medical management for sure. Um, importantly, it also helps inform your family's risk. We can tell you what your risks are to the rest of the family members, um, and it allows for them to have genetic testing so that they then can say, yes, I have this, I'm at risk, I need to be followed, or no, I don't, I'm not at risk, my kids aren't at risk, and I don't need to be followed. And then um, something that's exciting is coming more up are access to research and clinical trial op opportunities. A lot of clinical trials may say you have to have like CPVT, but it needs to be genetically confirmed. So sometimes having that genetic diagnosis allows you access to those clinical trials. Um, conversely, if your genetic testing is negative, that may open up research opportunities to try and identify the underlying genetic cause in your family. So that can help. Um, some limitations. We don't know everything, we're still learning. <laughs> um, so the, no test is perfect um, for long QT. About 75 to 80% of the time, we can identify the underlying genetic cause. CPVT is a little less, so it's about um, 50 to 60% of the time we can identify it, and Brigada syndrome is even lower. So about 25% of the time we can identify it. Um, which is important because what that means is a negative doesn't take away your clinical diagnosis. So if you've been clinically diagnosed with Brugada syndrome and your genetic test was negative, that doesn't negate what's been given to you clinically. And then those VUS or uncertain results that we talked about can really be anxiety provoking for some people. I think a lot of people a lot was something we could talk about in genetic testing, but people may know how they deal with uncertainty. And sometimes if people are really, really anxious, we will talk through that and like, um, or we always talk about it with families, but just kind of knowing how you may react to that based on how you dealt with uncertainty in the past can be helpful. Um, okay. That's all I wanted to say there. Questions about any of this so far? I wanted to give a couple, oh yes, go ahead. Uh-huh. How it's changed? It's a good question. So I have, um, I'll, I'll answer, I have a little bit more detail about VUSs. So there's a couple of things. I always... Um, encourage my patients to check back every few years with either the genetic counselor um, or just the genetic testing lab to see if there's been any updates because some labs, well, a lot of labs that we use will um, send amended reports if they've updated the classification of something. So we will get that information, but if they've not really looked into it or seen other patients at that lab, they may not issue an amended report, but the genetic counselor um, or even the genetic counselors at labs can help relook into something to see if maybe there's been new been new cases that they've seen that's helped move that one way or the other. So definitely you can check back every few years and labs will reissue updated reports too. And then there's research too. So if there's re people that are looking into that, um, usually your giant counselor can hook you up with somebody who may 
um, be an expert in that particular gene that was identified so that maybe we can move it along someday to get more functional information about how that genetic change actually um, impacts the gene's function. It's a good question. I know they're this lingering thing out there for a lot of people. Usually they have, a lot of the labs now have genetic counselors that will talk to people about things. So yeah, um, if you've not had a genetic counselor that you ordered the testing, um, so a lot of them you can call the labs and see if they have GCs that will talk about it. Um, okay, pause. Question. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So I uh, want to ask about the tests, genetic testings that are performed uh, with different labs. How they match each other, or it's it's a so you they're pretty um, equal in the genes that they include for the most common inherited arrhythmias, um, and their technologies now, depending on who ordered the test and what they ordered, <laughs> um, are pretty similar as well. So there are different ways that the lab can look at genes. Um, they can look at them basically like spell check, right? That's the most common way is there's like a spelling error in the gene. Um, and so it causes that gene not to function properly. But sometimes there can also be missing or extra pieces of a gene. Um, it's kind of like probably if you've seen a genetic counselor, they might use this analogy. It's like if you're spell checking if it's a book you wrote, you're not going to miss a missing page or a missing paragraph because you're just not looking for that. And conversely, if you're looking for a missing page or a missing paragraph, you're not going to find a spelling error. So usually we want to make sure both of those things are being done when we're looking at a gene. So it depends on um, when the testing was done and what genes were identified at that time, what we knew about, th new things get added, um, and then making sure both of, both of those methods were included. But now, when I think across all the most commonly used genetic labs, most of the genes that they have are similar um, for, like, especially long QT, CPBT, and Brigada. Yep. And if you've had genetic testing, I encourage to get a copy of your report. <laughs> so if you change or move, it is helpful if, um, especially if it was negative. I mean, even if it was positive and you have a family member who would like testing, um, it's helpful to know like, oh, well, the, you know, we, we identified this new gene associated with XYZ and that wasn't included in your panel. Let's do that now. So it can be helpful too. So usually genetic counselors will send them, but even if you had it through your cardiologist's office, um, I recommend requesting a copy of that to store in your records it can be helpful um okay back to this a positive case example i just wanted to give you some to show you how genetic testing can kind of impact the family this case in particular um is cpvt so the proband here the first person that came to our attention is a male who was a teenager who had a syncopal event while he was running um, and then he was brought in and he had a normal resting EKG a normal echo but his exercise test was very suspicious for CPVT. So before he had genetic testing what we would have counseled them on is it's mostly dominant which means there's a 50% chance to your first degree family members, parents, children, um, he doesn't have children, he's only 16, but for his parents to also be affected and we would recommend that they come in and get screening and evaluated like they're at risk. Um, so that was what we did prior to genetic testing because View it's um, CPVT. There are two two causes, or like two ways it can be passed down in a family. One's the dominant form, which is 50% to your family members, and there's also a recessive form, which means usually both care parents carry a genetic change, but they themselves aren't affected, but their child can inherit both of those and be affected. So we call that recessive. So if somebody's a carrier, they themselves typically don't have that condition, but if their child and um, has two non-working genes, they are affected. Um, so after we did testing for this individual, he actually has a recessive form, which is rare. Only like 3 to 5% of people with CPVT have this recessive form. The vast majority have a dominant form. So that allowed us, one, to confirm that he had CPVT, um, and the cardiologist could then take that and implement that into his medical management appropriately. Um, it also helped us give screening and family recommendations. So one, his parents were just carriers at that point, so they didn't need to have screening. They weren't at risk to have CPVT. And then we knew for his children, instead of if he had children being a 50% risk, it would just be that all of his children would be carriers for the condition and not affected. Most likely there's some 
some nuances to that down the line, but for <laughs> usually speaking. So it really can help us in giving information to the family um, and who may be at risk. Um, and then conversely, for a negative case example, um, so this is a female over here who fainted um, when she had a fever during COVID-19. And she came in, um, she was hospitalized, had an EKG, and they saw a possible Brugada pattern. So they recommended genetic testing for her. She had genetic testing, but it was negative. So in this case, we would counsel, unfortunately, only 25% of the time for Brugada syndrome, can we actually find what your underlying genetic cause is? Um, um, and so because of that, everybody is still at risk because that doesn't mean it's not genetic. There can still be risk to your family members, especially in the setting here of her brother dying suddenly at 49 is really suspicious that maybe this is being passed down in the family. So that risk is not gone because the testing was negative. So we would recommend all her first degree family members are screened and, and possibly avoid some of the triggers for Brugada syndrome. Um, and then she needs to be managed um, continue to be managed for that concern as well by her cardiologist. The genetic testing process has almost everybody gone through this. <laughs> um, I'll go over it, but um, you guys are probably familiar with this. So once somebody has decided, yep, I'm going to do genetic testing for myself, for my child, whoever it is, um, the genetic counselor or the physician will decide the best testing panel based on their clinical diagnosis. So there are panels for each of the inherited arrhythmias for the most part. Um, so we typically just order a specific uh, panel and unless it's something something like somebody had an unexplained cardiac arrest and we don't know exactly what their diagnosis is, we may look at everything, um, most inherited arrhythmias. So once they've ordered the test, it has to be ordered by a physician. We then do sample collection. So now, most of the time, it's either a cheek swab, super easy, um, sometimes saliva, which we're probably all familiar with, with COVID testing, the spit in the little tube, and then sometimes we have to do blood. Even now with the cheek swabs, we don't usually have to draw on babies. We can just do the cheek swab. So it's super simple. A lot of times, if you're in the office, they can collect it there. We can even ship kits to somebody's house. So you could do it within your home and they come with prepaid kits. You just mail it back to the lab. Um, the lab runs the test. And most of the time, you'll get the results back in three to four weeks. Once the results are back, then they come to the physician or giant counselor who helped order that, and they would be the ones to reach out to you and then go over those test results and the implications for your family. Um, switching gears a little bit. So I was going to go over some common questions, which some are about the VUSs and other things. So <laughs> I was thinking that. But if you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer um, as well. So if you've talked to a genetic counselor or your physician and they always say, well, we recommended that somebody is affected be tested first. And why is this? Um, one, as we mentioned, no genetic test is perfect, right? So none of these have a 100% chance of identifying what's going on in the family. So if we've not tested the person that's affected, we don't know if, if you're unaffected and we test you, well, did you just not inherit it? Or can we not identify what's going on in the family? And so then it's not really useful. We, it doesn't kind of impact your medical management because we don't have that information from the affected individual in the family. Um, so that goes to the, it's most beneficial for guiding testing for the family. Because if we test somebody who's affected and they're negative, we don't recommend testing for any family member because it's gonna be negative too. You go back to screening. Um, clinical screening. And if somebody's positive, then we'll start recommending uh, genetic testing for the rest of the family. Um, and rarely, there may be two underlying genetic causes. So usually you may hear people, we want to test the most affected individual in the family. We recognize that's not always possible. <laughs> um, but sometimes if, if somebody in the family is for whatever reason, more severely affected, um, we may recommend that they're the first ones tested or that they have a full panel because sometimes people can actually have two genetic changes and then that's going to change what we recommend for the rest of the family as well and can impact kind of what the uh, can be helpful for the cardiologist and the healthcare team too. 
What if your genetic testing is negative? We've gone through this a little bit. So this slide is if you're affected. Um, possible alternative diagnosis, it kind of depends. The genetic counselor does not work in a silo. They work with the cardiologist. We would never say that. So we would give the information to your cardiologist to work as part of that healthcare team to say, hey, this was what was found. Um, maybe they were suspicious for an acquired long QT form from some medication you were taking and you've stopped it and it's normalized and you had a negative genetic test. So it can be helpful in that. Um, we may not know the cause yet. So it may be genetic, but we just haven't identified what that cause is. And then this speaks to what I was talking to earlier. Um, there may be new genes. So if you were tested years ago, there might be something new that's been identified. I, I think that the calm genes were more recently that they were added, but it, maybe it was five years ago now. But for some of the CPVT um, clinical uh, uh, phenotypes or features, there's been trickling in of new genes over the past like five to so years. Um, so it can be helpful to come back in for a reassessment. And sometimes the testing that was ordered in the past might have just looked for those spelling changes and didn't look for missing or extra pieces. So there can be some other reasons that uh, genetic counselor could also help you look if you were gen um, tested a while back to see if there's anything new that would warrant it or if anything was missed in the testing methodology. If you're unaffected, it kind of depends on, is there a known variant in the family? So if somebody in your family has a positive test and you're negative, that typically we mean you're not at risk for that condition. You didn't inherit what was being passed down in the family. Your children are no longer at risk and you don't need to be screened. Um, if you are unaffected and there's not a known family mutation, so for whatever reason you were um, tested because, well, it could have been that the person who was affected um, passed away unexpectedly and wasn't available to be tested, um, but for whatever reason there's not been an affected person tested, really what that does is we go back and just screen you. We do not release you from care and we say you need screening based on your family history. <coughs> VUSs. So we talked about them a little bit. <laughs> um, so what is it? Um, it's usually a spelling change, not always, in a gene that we just don't know if it damages the gene or it's completely harmless. I like to say these are very, very common. The more genes that we look at, the higher chance we have to find them because we all have changes that are unique to us and unique to our family. And if we've just not seen them, not we, but the lab has not seen them before, they really err on the side of caution. We do not want to release somebody from care um, or over treat somebody based on some uncertainty. So they are very common. We treat them like a negative um, and family screening should be based on family history. We may recommend testing for other, un, uh, other affected individuals in the family. So let's say we have an uncertain result, but they're kind of suspicious of it. And you've got multiple other people that have the same condition or suspected condition. We may say, okay, let's test them because if that is the cause in the family, we would expect that all those people who are affected also share that same genetic change. It can help the lab um, gather more information to your point to eventually one day um, be able to say one way or the other if it is positive or negative. So it might not change it at that moment in time, but it can be helpful down the line. Um, and then we talked about this. We're always learning more. Please come back and check. Um, and it can be helpful if you have any updates in your family history to notify your genetic counselor and they can touch, touch base with the lab because there may be someone else in the family we can test now and do cascade screening on um, if somebody else had a new diagnosis or something happened. So that can all, all be added to um, the evidence to eventually, hopefully one day, know more about that genetic change. And then lastly, um, people ask about insurance and genetic testing. So I have, think of insurance in three different buckets. Health insurance and employment are um, protected under something called GINA, which is the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act. No. In Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. There you go. Sorry, I was missing a word. Um, and this was a federal law that was passed in 2008. It does cover health insurance and employment. There are some um, things that aren't covered under that, like if you are in the military, um, that is not covered. So for employment, um, some employers that are less than 15 um, individuals are also not covered. Um, but for the most part, most of your uh, commercial 
health insurance plans cannot deny you coverage based on a positive genetic test. Um, and same with employment, except for those few um, stipulate. Oh, I wonder. Um, life insurance is its own beast, and they can um, choose to deny somebody coverage based on genetic testing, but even a personal um, clinical diagnosis. So they can say, oh, you have XYZ condition, we don't want to cover you either. So they can, it's kind of their own separate world and is not included in the GINA law. So your genetic counselor may talk to you about if that's something you're worried about or you don't have life insurance. Some people want to get a life insurance policy before they proceed with genetic testing, um, especially if they don't have a clinical diagnosis of yet and they're doing it more for predictive reasons. Okay, and I think, I don't know when I started. Oh, yeah. Um, so that's all I have. Um, any questions or concerns? I also have here, um, if you are interested in talking to a giant counselor, um, NSGC is kind of our organization and they have a fantastic tool on locating a genetic counselor. And there are even many giant counselors that will talk to you remotely now. So if you live somewhere that is not close to one of the centers, there are some companies that offer um, remote or telehealth genetic counseling and some of even the hospital institutions do as well. Yes. Yeah. So one of my kids tested and was negative, mm -hmm. but recently went to the pediatrician, was sick, and she's like, well, I'm not going to give her this antibiotic because it could interfere with long QT. But I said, yeah, but she tested negative. And she's like, yeah, but still it's in the family. So was your testing positive or was it a VUS in the family? It's a VUS, but she was negative. She didn't have it. So that makes sense in the setting of a VUS. Oh. Because I don't know. So here's me, okay. my stipulation. I don't know your exact variant, so I okay. can look and do whatever. But typically, if I'm talking about VUSs, we, if we, um, if there's not a lot of convincing or research evidence that we think it's the cause of the disease in the family, we don't even test other family members unless they're affected. So... If somebody's tested for a VUS in the family, we normally don't release them from care. We at least say come back, get screening, and we would probably, and I'll probably defer to some, I don't want to overstep the cardiologist in the office as well, um, avoid the triggers too until we know for sure that that either is the cause in the family or isn't because we don't want to release somebody from care based on a VUS and we're wrong about it. It's not the cause and then something happens down the line. So I, I agree, not knowing the details, that's probably why. Thank you.